morning, Beaver Ridge United Methodist Church. Things look a little bit different this week as Pastor Larry is on vacation, but please do not tune out quite yet. He is still going to bring you the sermon, so there goes that excuse. I'm joking. We know that you listen to it, and we are very thankful for everything you do through this time and know that we are trying our best to make sure we bring you the best content and be able to bring you the best service we possibly can. Now, if you will, please give your attention to Travis Burnett as he brings us the children's sermon. Hello, children of Beaver Ridge. I hope you had another great week, and I hope you remembered to say your prayers, take your vitamins, wash your hands, and let your actions show God's love. Right now, we're in a very unique and challenging time in our lives as we deal with this global pandemic. And it's affected nearly everything we do and forced us to change many of our normal routines in order to keep people from getting sick. And even with all these changes, people have still caught the virus and some have even died. So my questions tonight aren't the easy kind. They are, why do you think God lets things like this happen? And does anything good come out of bad situations like this? Well, I have some pictures to show you of what some people decided to do during this pandemic. And looking at these pictures, I know that God is very happy when people help each other. And that's one of the good things that comes out of these situations. Well, in our Bible story today, found in Genesis 37, which I hope you read at home with your parents, Joseph was a man who found himself in a bad situation. His own brothers got jealous of him when his father Jacob gave him a new coat, a beautiful coat of many colors. In fact, his brothers were so jealous of him that they were going to kill him. But instead, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. More bad things happened to Joseph while he was in Egypt. And even though he didn't do anything wrong, he was thrown into prison. How would you like for all those things to happen to you? But years later, God used Joseph to warn the people of Egypt about a time when there wouldn't be enough food. He made a plan to keep all the people of Egypt from starving, and the Pharaoh made him the second in, second in charge of the whole country. That's a big change, isn't it? He went from being a slave to a prisoner to being the second in charge of a whole country. But he wouldn't have been in Egypt to save the people and become the second in charge if all those bad things didn't happen to him in the first place. So God used Joseph's bad situation for something really good. Joseph himself said the same thing to his brothers many years later. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is being done, the saving of many lives. So when bad things happen to us, we should have faith that God is going to bring something good out of that bad situation. Now, we don't always see the good right away or even always understand God's plan. But know that God is an all-powerful creator who's always working for our good. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Please help us to trust you when bad situations happen. Thank you for bringing good things out of those bad situations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As times continue to look uncertain, we are faced with many joys and many concerns. Know that we hear each and every single one that you send to us, and we are praying for them, and even the ones you don't, we know that there are many things on your heart. So don't be afraid to send those to us, to text them to us, Facebook message, however you want, just so we can be able to pray for you. Now, if you would, please bow your head with me for this morning's prayer. Lord, we thank you for today and all that you bring to us. And please let every word and song from our mouths, Lord, be to you in your service. And let it be the words that you want us to bring to these people, Lord. Let them be able to hear you through us today as we worship you together. Be it through this unusual means, though it's becoming more usual as time goes on. Lord, we thank you for all of this. And please lift every single concern in these wonderful people's hearts and hold them dearly as we know that they are waving, weighing heavily on them. Lord, there are many things to celebrate as students are going off to college this week to move into dorms. We know that it's kind of weird for them. They're moving out in a very uncertain time, but please bless them and let them be able 
to do the things that you want them to do through school. Please keep a hedge of protection on teachers, on students, on every staff member that is going out into the schools as school begins up this week, next, and so on. Lord, we thank you again, and we love you dearly, Lord. So if you would, please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
morning, church. It's good to see you. I hope, well, technically I can't see you. You're seeing me, but I wish I could see you. Uh, actually, I am on vacation right now, but we decided to do it this way since we were out anyway, and rather than invite someone in to try to work through all the technical uh, challenges that we're facing, that I go ahead and do the sermons while I was gone. So even while I'm gone, I get to get to preach at you, and I'm happy to, to do that. I hope you're well. I hope you're taking care of each other, and I hope if you need anything, you'll let us know. So please uh, don't forget to be in touch and let us know if we can do anything at all. Our sermon text from today comes from Genesis 37, 1 through 4 and 12 through 28. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than he loved any of his other children, because he was the son of his old age. And he had, made him with a, uh, he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to one of his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite trader passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. This is the word of God for each of us children of God. Thanks be to God. In history, the history of, of human beings, there's always been a fantasy about time travel. Uh, we see lots of movies about it. There are time-bending ways to get back and forth to different places. Uh, they ask a question of us, what would happen if we could time travel in history? Back to the Future, a very popular series, tells of, of Marty McFly who, who finds a way to travel in a car-shaped time machine entering the world of his parents when they were teenagers. The Terminator is a classic piece of science fiction where Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a robot sent from the future back to 1984 Los Angeles so that he can dispose of a man who would be born to lead people out of the bondage and, and to, to play a very important role as a hero in the wars of the future. Even Harry Potter series of 
they, they dabbled in time travel. In Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry and Hermione were able to travel in time through a time tuner in an effort to save Hogwarts and to save his friends. More recently, the superheroes of the Avengers Endgame used time travel to save the universe from a big purple monster man. Time travel movies. They, they're interesting to watch, but they do raise a, a, a question for us to consider. If you could travel in time, if you could go back in time, what would be the place you would go to and why? The Atlantic Magazine asked this question of some university professors. Duke Professor Sandy Darity says, I wish that radical reconstruction had been made a reality at the end of the Civil War. If this had happened, former slaves would have enjoyed full political participation along with control over the schooling of their children. Protection by the Union Army, land grants of 40 acres for farming. Marina Warmer of the University of London says that she wishes that Ferdinand, <coughs> excuse me, Ferdinand and Isabella had torn up the Alhambra decree, which drove all the Jews out of the Spanish territories. History would look very different, she says, if if the coexistence of Jews, Muslims, and Christians had had been a part of our history, had been going on all along. Rutgers professor Samantha Kelly has a suggestion that is, well, it's a little bit weird, different. She wishes that agriculture had never been invented, which is kind of an interesting uh, take on things. But she says there would be far less environmental degradation and income inequality if there was a world without industrial agriculture. It would be more like Garden of Eden in the Bible. People would, would uh, grow only what they need and, and not be wasteful or not be uh, greedy. She wants to go back in time to this Garden of Eden concept where everybody has what they need. So I asked the question, what change would you make? What place would you go to? Maybe you would prevent the assassination of Abraham Lincoln overthrow Adolf Hitler before the Second World War. Or maybe you would save Jesus from the agony of the cross. In the book of Genesis, a man named Jacob settled in the land of Canaan. He had 12 sons, and one of them was named Joseph. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children, it says, because he was a child of his old age. And we kind of understand what that means. Uh, the baby in the family is is often the the uh, the choice child for many people. I remember in my family, um, we always called my aunt, who was the baby, the princess. She was always a princess, even though they all grew up on a farm. But apparently, the princess didn't have to work as hard as the others did, or didn't have to do the same kind of chores. So treated different. But I don't think it's really because they loved her more. It's just that she came around when. When other things were already established, things were changing. I understand why, but here is Jacob who loved Joseph more than any of his other children, and he made him a coat with long sleeves. We have heard of that coat called a coat of many colors. You can imagine how this made his brothers feel that Joseph not only was the favored child, but even got special wardrobe consideration. That's That certainly had something to do with them being angry, I guess. They hated him. They could not speak peaceably to him, it says. Joseph was a dreamer. One of the dreams he told them contained the message that his brothers would bow down to him, and this didn't go over too well either. This didn't help things at all. If you could go back in history, you might go back to Jacob the father and say, don't play favorites with Joseph. His brothers hate him. At age 17, Joseph was shepherding the flock with his brother, acting as a helper. Four of them were misbehaving in the field, so Joseph told on them to, this, to his father. He brought a report to his father. Dan and Naphtali and Gad and Asher, he threw them under the bus because of the way they were behaving. If you could go back in time, you might say to, to Joseph, don't be a snitch. Don't, don't get your brothers in trouble. They're going to they're gonna try to kill you. 
The situation went from bad to worse when Joseph was sent to check on his brothers as they took care of the flock. He went after them, found them at a place called Dothan. His brothers saw him from a distance and they conspired to kill him when they saw him coming. They said, here comes a streamer. Let's kill him and throw him into one of these pits. Then we'll tell dad that a wild animal has devoured him. We'll see what will become of his dreams then. If you could employ a time turner like in Harry Potter, you might say to his brothers, when you go back, don't do it. You will never get away with murder. And fortunately, fortunately, the oldest brother, Reuben, talked some sense into him. And he said, don't, let's not kill him. Let's not get blood on our hands. He is our brother. He is kin. And he planned to come back and rescue Joseph after the fact and restore him to his father. But uh, they decided to listen to Reuben and they put him in a pit. Uh, they stripped him of his robe and they decided that they would leave him there to die. When they sat down to eat though, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming in the distance. They were on their way from Gilead traveling to Egypt carrying a cargo of, of goods. And between bites, middle brother Judah said, what profit is it if we kill our brother? What does that do to serve us? Really nothing. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And they all agreed. So when the caravan came close, they drew Joseph up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And the traveling traders took Joseph to Egypt. If you could be a time traveler, you might say to the brothers, glad you didn't kill him, but selling him into slavery, is that a good deal? The story of Joseph and his brothers make us want to go back in time, maybe, and make some changes. And why not? Most of us, most of us could think of positive choices that might have changed history and improved the world. Protecting Jews in 15th century Spain, saving Lincoln from assassination, supporting Reconstruction after the Civil War, all would have been good for God's people in some terribly trying times. But we should never forget that God is always working toward a surprising conclusion, even when humans are acting in terrible ways, even when we think everything is bad and, and uh, as one of my members said, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. But, but we forget that God takes those conditions and makes something else out of it. In the book of Genesis, Joseph was sold to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, which was bad. But Joseph found favor in his sight and was put in charge of his house, which was good. Then his wife saw how handsome Joseph was and said, I want you to come lie with me. And, and, and that was bad. Joseph refused because he was a man of character. He was not going to do that. And he was thrown into prison, which was bad. Then God showed him love and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer, which was good for him. Clearly, God is always working to a surprising conclusion. Joseph was in a bad place, then a good place, then a bad place, then a good place, because God is working. Even when humans are misbehaving, God is at work. If we were to go back in time and change history, we might disrupt the work that God is doing for the world. While in prison, Joseph became an interpreter of dreams. Uh, he, he eventually was offered insight into the dreams of the Pharaoh. He was released from prison and rose to power in Egypt, becoming second in command to Pharaoh himself. Eventually, famine struck the entire region, and people from many countries came to Egypt to buy bread, to find food. Among the hungry that came to Egypt that Joseph saw were his brothers, the very ones who sold him into slavery and put him in a position to be second in command to Pharaoh. At first, he did not reveal his identity, and he treated them very severely. But eventually, he agreed to help them and said, Even though you intended to harm me, you intended to kill me, God intended it for good, and 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 use those things for good in order to save his people. At the end of the story, J Joseph forgave his brothers and provided for them as God wanted him to do. 
You intended to do me harm, said Joseph, naming clearly that his brothers did a great evil to him. But knowing that God is always working toward a surprising conclusion, he also said, God intended it for good. In every time and in every place, I believe God is working out God's purposes. Sometimes we cooperate with those purposes. Sometimes we don't. Often we don't even see them until maybe after the fact. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. Foresight is challenging at best. Even when bad things are going on that we would like to change, in world history, even in our own personal histories, these can be used for good, for the glory of God. God is not responsible for the evil that people do, but history shows that God can use that and turn it into something very, very different. God did it with Joseph and his brothers. God did it with Jesus on the cross. God did it with Paul, who moved from a persecutor of the church to, a, to one of the apostles to the Gentiles, the the reason the church grew in the world because of what God did with a man who was doing bad. Nothing is wasted with God, nothing. When Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, they set a stage for his rise in Egypt. When Jesus died and was buried, he was put in the right place for resurrection. The zeal of Saul the persecutor changed in the passion, into the passion of Paul the apostle. Each of us has committed sins. Each of us suffered defeats or made terrible mistakes or has been treated badly. We might want to jump in a time machine and change the past, but remember, God is always at work in our life, turning the things that are going bad in our life into good things. Nothing is wasted with God. I believe that with all that I am. There's no point in trying to change history. Instead, we're called to trust God to change our, our history and transform it into our future. We're called to trust God and his will, his presence, his power in our lives to change our person, our being, our efforts, our desires, our, our abilities, our gifts, all these things for his glory, for what he needs from us as his children, his church. So I hope that you do trust God. I think he's got good things for you, good things in store for all of us. I hope you trust God to use those things that you see as difficulties and, and as problems and let him use those and transform them into a future as children of God for you and for me and for, for all those that we love. God bless you and keep you in his care. Take care of yourself wash your hands, continue to pray for me and for each other, for we are God's church and we follow him still. Amen.
hi again. I know it's weird seeing me this many times in one service. It's kind of weird for me too, but I'm really glad I get to do it. I love being able to pray for you all, and I'm just glad you get to pray with me right now. So if you would please close out this service with me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for today and all the blessings you have brought us throughout the week. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful weather, for the rain, for everything you have given us. Lord, thank you for Larry, for the praise team, for everything that you have blessed us with to be able to do this, Lord. Especially thank you for Mark, for without him I would be running audio. Lord, please bless each and every single one of our congregants, our viewers, whoever it is tuning into this, and even those who don't, Lord, as we know we all need your blessings all the time. Lord, give us the ability to show you to the world through our actions, through our words, and even through our thoughts, Lord. Lord, let us be able to continue to serve you as we go throughout this week. And thank you for everything you have done, you are doing, and you will be doing for us, Lord. Lord, please bless a hedge of protection around all those going into the world, be it into work, into school, or even just to the grocery store. Lord, please just watch out for each and every one of us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Amen. Have a blessed week, and we look forward to seeing you next week through the same media, and we hope we get to see you in person again soon because we miss you very, very much. Have a wonderful week.